So welcome to the RBR webinar series. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to be giving a short product overview of the RBR Concerto CTD, which Anna Michelle, one of our speakers after this short section, will be speaking about how she's using it on an autonomous platform. Uh, I'm, my name is Eric Siegel. I'm the sales director for RBR. So RBR makes several things. We make sensors, loggers, systems, and OEM products. Uh, particularly today, we'll be speaking about the loggers, which is an assembly of different sensors, such as uh, temperature, oxygen, uh, conductivity, pressure, turbidity, things like that. Uh, and that's what we'll be focusing on today. So here's an overview of what some of our products are. We're specifically going to be speaking about the RBR Concerto CTD near the middle here. Uh, but you can see we have other sensors, such as the oxygen sensor, um, temperature loggers, and multi-channel multi -channel CTDs as well but the RBR Concerto CTD is what we're going to focus on. So this has the highest accuracy sensors that you can um, use for oceanography. So the conductivity cell is, uh, has an accuracy of 0 0.003 millisiemens per centimeter, the temperature sensor 0 0.002 degrees Celsius, and the depth sensor is 0.05% of full scale accuracy. And we can choose um, full scales as shallow as 20 meters or as deep as, uh, as 6,000 meters. Uh, the RBR Concerto CTD will log 240 million readings at up to 32 hertz. Uh, it can come in a couple different configurations. So typically people will do vertical profiling CTDs with FAST8, which is 8 hertz sampling, FAST16, or up to FAST32 sampling. Uh, the one you see here in the plastic version is rated to 750 meters, and that's the one that Anna is using. Uh, but we also uh, make them in titanium to 2,000 meters and even 6,000 meter rating. Uh, all of the systems have, uh, you can download the data internally through USB-C, very fast download, but they also have twist activation and Wi-Fi download, which I'll speak about in a moment. The Concerto CTDs can hold up to two other sensors. So typically this might be dissolved oxygen and turbidity, but we can log other things such as fluorescence, PAR, pH, ORP, pretty much any sensor that you want to measure, we can put on the Concerto CTD. And if you want to measure more than two other channels, then we would move up to the RBR Maestro. It's still the same CTD. It's still the same internal electronics. Uh, the only difference is it's a slightly larger sensor head, so we can put more instruments on it. So here we can put up to 10 channels. So that would be perhaps CTD plus oxygen, turbidity, fluorescence, pH, PAR, ORP, pretty much all of those. Again, this has USB-C and uh, twist activation and Wi-Fi as an option. Moving a little bit smaller, we have the RBR Brevio CTD, which looks a lot like the Concerto CTD, uh, but it's shorter. Instead of having eight AA batteries inside, it only has four. It's about this long, uh, and it only comes in a version for CTD. And we're finding that these are frequently used on surface vehicles and underwater vehicles, AUVs, ROVs, things like that places where you want to have something very small, but still highly accurate for CTD measurements. Uh, here's an example of a, a jet yak doing an emission in Greenland. Uh, this is not the one Anna will be speaking about, but it's a similar implementation. And this could use a very small CTD, such as the RBR Brevio CTD. All of the CTDs can come with uh, cabled real-time data telemetry. So at the end of the CTD, you can have an MCBH connector coming off the end or at a right angle. And I think Anna will speak about how she was using uh, this one in the center. So it was providing uh, real-time CTD measurements to her platform, which she was then able to access if she wanted to see the real-time data. Um, alternatively, you can access data through Wi-Fi. So when you enable twist in, in, uh, activation, you just twist the end cap into the run mode. When you twist it into the run mode, uh, the Wi-Fi is enabled. And then you can, once it's in the air, either before the deployment or after, you can access the data uh, through your mobile device, such as um, a tablet or a phone, uh, or to your laptop, all through Wi-Fi. If we look at deployment configurations, here we have the Concerto CTD uh, sampling at 16 hertz, and you can see that it will run for 38 days continuously at 16 hertz. In this case, we actually run out of memory, but we could have uh, run for another 16 days on battery if we wanted to sample a little bit slower. But with 38 days continuously at 16 hertz means is essentially Anna could run her platform continuously for 12 hours a day while she's surveying uh, for about 80 days. So that would be almost the entire summer 
running at 12 hours a day at 16 hertz and never have to change the battery. That's how low power we're talking here. Uh, once we put some other sensors on, for example, this is an oxygen sensor and a turbidity sensor, those optical sensors, they use a little bit more power. Uh, here, if we were sampling at eight hertz, we could run continuously for seven days before we run out of battery. Uh, and so if we gave a similar situation, if she wanted to run uh, for 12 hours a day, she could run it for two weeks continuously uh, and then change eight batteries and then go for another two weeks. Uh, so that's about it with the products. I, I do want to mention that uh, we're really happy to have Anna as one of our RBR 2020 cohort members. This is a program that we launched at the beginning of the year uh, for 16 early career faculty, uh, uh, early career researchers in oceanography. And Anna is one of our members and she's going to be doing some interesting work and maybe she'll present this next year when she actually gets to accomplish it, uh, where she's going to put some of the RBR CTDs and, uh, and very small compact um, optical oxygen sensors on, on the blue ROVs and make some nice measurements under ice. And we're going to try to help support her in terms of that and some instrumentation development as part of that RBR 2020 cohort program. Uh, so just moving very quickly into the future webinars. As I said, we do these every week. Next week, we're going to have uh, Eric Oliver from Dalhousie speak about community-based observing uh, in the coastal ocean in Labrador. And following that, the following week, uh, Brittany Schmidt from Georgia Institute of Technology will be talking about CTD measurements from vertical profiling CTDs and uh, their ice fin, which is an AUV ROV hybrid um, in Antarctica. So we're really looking forward to those. Uh, if you're trying to stay cool this summer, those two projects uh, surrounded by ice will help that. And I want to thank you for joining this short introduction. I'm going to now turn it over to Anna, and we're going to do a quick interview with her to learn more about her. So let me just change my settings here. Okay, Anna, we've got you here on video, which is great. So um, short introduction to the speaker. Anna, can you tell us a little more about your background in, in oceanography and science? Sure, great. Thanks for having me today. Um, so my undergrad is actually in engineering. Um, I actually went to MIT and studied chemical engineering and biology, um, but kind of always knowing I wanted to be an oceanographer. Um, so then I actually got my master's in ocean engineering at MIT, and then I joined the joint program um, between MIT and Hui and earned my PhD in oceanographic engineering. Um, after that, I went to Princeton, where I actually moved to more atmospheric sensing. And so my PhD was in laser spectroscopy, and I went to Princeton to learn a different kind of laser spectroscopy, um, working with no water at all. Um, and I came back in 2012 to Woods Hole, where I brought some of those technologies um, using laser spectroscopy to the ocean. Cool. Well, we're happy to have you back in the ocean environment. Uh, hopefully, it's been good for you. Uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about how you've been involved in this specific pro project? Sure. So this has been a collaboration um, with two universities in Canada. Um, and so Rue Nicholson, who's also on the call, will be joining us for the Q&A. Um, and I worked together to develop this Chemiac system. And through a collaboration um, with the University of British Columbia, um, I will talk about this a little bit in the talk today about how they've been doing these measurements and how they were interested in getting some finer scale measurements. And the Chemiac really worked well in this environment. So we, we started working with them. Um, to try to do some more high resolution measurements. And that's how we got involved with this project. Okay, and part of what we like about this ocean science community is the people, not just for the science, but for the, their interesting things. So tell us uh, one fun fact that most people on this call might not know about you. So a fun fact would be that um, this summer I've learned how to paddleboard. And actually what I found interesting about that is that now you can get um, paddle boards with motors on them. And so I've been thinking a lot about how we could actually go from the Chemiac to a a paddleboard system that might actually be easier in some of these environments. Cool. We, uh, we made a bunch of RBR stand-up paddleboards uh, last year, and some of our customers have them. Uh, Clark Richardson from, uh, um, Clark Richards from uh, DFO has been paddling around a little bit this summer doing some deployments. We've wanted to put oh, the, smart cool. fin, uh, the script smart fin on those, but I think that coupled with, uh, with a motor would be pretty fun. So maybe you can be the first person to do yeah, that. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, so I think you've got your screen sharing set up. Do you want to give it a try now? I think it should work now. Okay, we've got you here. So please take this. it away. Great, does that seem to work now? Looks good. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Again, I'm Anna Michelle, and I'm an associate scientist in the Department of Applied Ocean Physics and Engineering at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And this work I'm presenting today has been done um, in partnership with, with David Rue Nicholson. Um, he's on this call, and he'll be joining us 
um, at the end for Q&A, and he's an associate scientist in marine chemistry and geochemistry also at Hui. Uh, today I'm going to present our work on advancing sensor technologies for measuring Arctic methane, um, talking about the Chemiac project in Cambridge Bay. So in my lab, we focus on developing new sensors and sensing platforms for studying ocean chemistry. Um, we want to develop new in-situ sensors because we know that there's only a limited number of sensors for studying ocean chemistry. Um, it's also important because we can then do real-time analysis. By developing new sensors, we can also make high spatial and temporal measurements. And moving from samplers to sensors, um, which is something Erica had just mentioned, is that we can actually go to longer term deployments, uh, making those possible. Now, new chemical sensors are really important for a variety of studies in ocean science, um, from environmental chemistry, ocean monitoring, um, even uh, marine archaeology has applications that chemical sensors can help, um, ocean exploration, defense applications, petroleum applications, chemical sensors really can have a big impact on all these fields. Now, most everyone is aware that there's this increase in carbon dioxide over time. Um, you can see that here with this blue line. But methane is another key greenhouse gas, and you see it here in this red and black line, and it's also increasing. Now, global concentrations of methane are rising much faster in the atmosphere currently than at any other time in the past two decades. So not only is it very important to be able to study carbon dioxide, but it's also critically important to study methane changes. So when we think about the kinds of environments where we want to develop sensors to study and we want to develop sensor platforms to study, there's a lot of different environments where carbon dioxide and methane are really important. So for example, um, you can see the little jet yak on the right there. Um, in these estuary environments, it's really important to study these greenhouse gases. In the deep ocean, there are sites such as methane seeps, where we want to be able to understand the methane coming out. There's interesting environments such as hydrothermal vents, where there's a lot of different ocean chemistry going on. Uh, submarine volcanoes, where a lot of carbon dioxide can come out. Um, and methane hydrates, you can see that as that white ice-like structure. And then also in the coastal Arctic environments, it's very important to study um, these greenhouse gases. So my lab typically uses infrared laser spectroscopy. And the laser-based sensors are really ideal for use in ocean science because we only need optical access to our samples. We don't need any reagents. We don't need to prepare our samples in any way. We can use one laser to often detect many different species. Um, we can also use this approach sometimes to measure isotopes. So what we do in laser spectroscopy is we choose a laser that emits light at a certain wavelength. Now that wavelength of the laser is chosen to be the same wavelength where the species of light absorbs, uh, where the species of interest absorbs light. Now as that laser light passes through the gas sample, which you can see here with the red line, if any of the species of interest is present, the light is absorbed. And now we can correlate the amount of light that's absorbed to the concentration of that gas present. Now, laser spectroscopy has many advantages for use in ocean sensing. It's a highly sensitive technique. It's highly selective, meaning you can target certain gases. It's non-destructive, meaning that the sample does not need to be destroyed in any way. Uh, the measurements are fast. Uh, the systems can be made field robust. Now, infrared spectroscopy can be used to measure any gas, a suite of gases, or even isotopes that have an infrared signature. Now, some key gases that have infrared signatures are critically important to measure for studies in atmospheric chemistry, oceanography, climate change science, and even Arctic science. And these gases include nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and methane. And a key point here is that many atmospheric gases are also very important in the ocean. Now, infrared techniques have been developed primarily for highly sensitive measurements of trace gases. But another key point is that infrared spectroscopy requires gas samples. So obviously we wanna study dissolved gases, so we need to actually get the gas out of the seawater in order to be able to make the measurements. So by coupling a membrane inlet to laser-based infrared sensors, we can actually adapt these sensors for analysis in the ocean. And so in this talk, I'm gonna demonstrate how we're actually doing this. So again, infrared spectroscopy has really been developed for atmospheric gas sensing. It's been developed for highly sensitive measurements of pollutants, agricultural emissions, and greenhouse gas emissions. But commercially available off-the-shelf systems are available. You can see one here. This is actually a light core system that you can buy, and you can use it to measure um, carbon dioxide and methane in such environments as salt marshes. You see a flux chamber on the side. 
So you can make these kinds of measurements by these systems commercially off the shelf. But we can also take these kinds of instruments and we can adapt them so that we can actually use them in the ocean, specifically for coastal and shallow ocean environments. So we're using a Los Gatos Research a greenhouse gas analyzer, which uses a technique called off-axis integrated cavity output spectroscopy. This analyzer um, is seen on the bottom right. You can see it's been packaged for rugged environments and field work. And the way that it works is if you look on the left, there you can see the diode laser. So the laser shines into this gas cell. And in that gas cell, there's these two very highly reflective mirrors. So you pump your gas into this gas cell, and that laser light bounces back and forth lots and lots of times, interacting with the sample that's in there. So by doing that, um, you can achieve a path length that's on the order of kilometers. And that laser light interacting lots and lots of times with that sample can allow you to achieve highly sensitive measurements. Now this system itself, it can, is developed using, for measuring methane and carbon dioxide by having multiple lasers. So each laser is specifically chosen to measure a certain gas. Um, again, the key features here are that it can do carbon dioxide and methane. It's designed to be rugged. And again, it has this um, special gas cell so that we can interact with the light lots of times um, to be able to make these highly precise measurements. Now again, this system that I just talked about is one that was developed for gas sensing. So again, infrared spectroscopy requires a gas sample, but our samples again are dissolved gases in seawater and freshwater. So we have to use a gas extraction approach to get that dissolved gas out of the seawater. So here we're using something called a membrane contactor, which you see in the middle. Um, it's that tubular-like um, object. And the contactor is composed of bundles of microporous fibers that allow for fast equilibration between a gas flow and the sample water that's pumped through it. Now, Las Gatos Reachers has a commercially available gas extractor that couples to the greenhouse gas analyzer that you see in the bottom right that uses this type of microfiber, microporous fiber bundles packaged into this field going system. Now, of course, with any system, there's always some challenges and drawbacks. And one drawback of this approach is the limitation in how much gas we can actually extract. So through laboratory tests, we've compared bottle samples, which you can see on the uh, x-axis, to the instrument measurements itself shown on the y-axis. But by doing this comparison, we can actually determine what our gas extraction efficiency is, so we can actually quantify the amount of gas that's present in the water. So we're able to calculate that only about 15% of the methane is actually extracted. Um, but again, by knowing this, we can then take our measurements and calculate what the actual uh, concentration of methane is. Now, to, to measure dissolved gases in seawater, we've developed the Chemiac, which you see here. Um, in the top left corner, you see, again, that Las Gatos research instrument that is packaged into the Chemiac. So this remote control kayak is outfit with a suite of instruments for analysis of the dissolved gases. So we utilize that dissolved gas extractor I talked about, and then the gases are analyzed using that Las Gatos research greenhouse gas analyzer. So this can tell us what the concentration of methane and carbon dioxide are in surface waters. Um, we use that RBR CTD uh, that Eric mentioned. Um, that's attached to a winch. So the winch, um, you can kind of see that, um, a little bit of a white um, column coming off the back of the jet yak. So that's the winch. Um, and so the CTD is actually attached to, to um, the winch, which not only lowers the CTD down, but it lowers a sampling line for pumping water to the dissolved gas extractor that's located on the Chemiac. I did see that Sam Monk is on this call today. And um, while he was a graduate student, um, in England, he came and spent um, about three months in our lab, and he actually designed this, this winch system, um, which has made a huge um, difference in the types of measurements we can do um, with the Kamiak. So this winch, this winch system allows us to actually make measurements of methane and carbon dioxide down to about 10 meters. So by using the CTD that's attached to that winch system, we can know what depth we're at for measuring the methane and carbon dioxide, but it also allows us to measure salinity. Now, the, the key point that we want to know about salinity, which you'll see later in this talk, it's critically important in the Arctic environment that we've been working in. It's an estuary where we have a lake, river, and bay continuum, where we're looking at the ice breaking up and this freshwater lens coming out. So us knowing which parcel of water that we're working at has been very important um, to look at what happens when the ice breaks up in this environment. Also on this system is an oxygen sensor and a nitrate sensor. 
Other key points about the Chemiac is that we're able to measure, monitor data in real time. We can drive the Chemiac or it can actually um, be given waypoints and it can go to different waypoints itself. In the future, we aim to have this vehicle be fully autonomous. So we've been working at Cambridge Bay, which is in Nunavut, a site in the Canadian Arctic. Um, as you can see on the right, it has a lake, it has a river, and it has a bay. So it's this nice continuum um, location to work with. In the winter, the system freezes, and we're really interested in understanding the impact of the methane release from this site. So the big open question is, how do greenhouse gas emissions from coastal Arctic waters vary seasonably? So our collaborators at the University of Calgary and the University of British Columbia have been sampling at this site. So each week, a sample is taken and analyzed for methane concentration. So I'm showing you here some of their data, looking at the left from 2017, and on the right is 2018. And you see this big spike. You can see it in the red and the blue um, data in about the June to July period. So you can see this large spike in methane occurs when the ice breaks up in the spring thaw. Now what this data is showing is there's a massive methane emissions associated with the river inflow. So we got very interested in this idea of there was this big spike and us being able to take the Chemiac to this location to try to resolve that spike a little bit uh, better than just having a single measurement every week. So by utilizing the Chemiac in this environment, we can start to gain a greater understanding of the release of methane during the spring thaw. We can even map out the spatial distribution of methane and carbon dioxide during this event. So here I'm going to show you a movie of the Chemiac being deployed and operated in these waters. And again, as I mentioned, the Chemiac can be operated using GPS waypoints. Um, and then what you're going to see um, is being operated in a remote controlled um, fashion. So what you're seeing here is one of our HUI engineers deploying the Chemiac. Um, and there um, is Victoria Preston, who's one of the graduate students in our joint program um, working in this environment. So now you can see the Chemiac um, driving along. You can see the winch on the side and you can see that sampling line um, in the water. And so we're continuously making measurements as the Chemiac drives along. And you can see there, Kevin in the front, he's actually looking at the data as the um, system is going um, and they're driving the Kamiak from um, that small boat. And the reason to do that is that in this environment, we just wanna make sure we're safe and we're not crashing the Kamiak into anything. So here's some of the data from this deployment. So on the left is that trajectory of the Kamiak from the river to the ice edge in Cambridge Bay. You can see this repeat path that we did. And on the right, you can see by using the CTD and lowering it down with the winch that the salinity on the top is much, much lower than the salinity on the bottom. So this freshwater lens of water has come down um, through the river and you see the salty layer below. So this is the river derived freshwater or melt. And what we found by using the Chemiac is that the river derived freshwater is found in about the upper uh, two meters. So here's some more data from this deployment. So again, the water is being pumped up from depth to the greenhouse gas analyzer that's on the Chemiac. So on the left, you can see the methane and how, the, how high the levels are. So the yellow um, is the highest amount of methane. And you can see that correlates to shallow surface water. So again, that's this freshwater lens of water that's coming from the river flowing down into the bay. And on the right, you see the PCO2 is again, very high in the surface water. So the yellow again is the high. And you can see again, this is from that freshwater coming down. So that you can see that this fresh water is bringing with it a high levels of methane and carbon dioxide. So measurements were made with the Chemiac over a series of days. Using this winch profiling system, we're able to make measurements about the top five meters in this deployment. And the left plot here shows the relationship between methane and depth. The right plot shows the relationship between PCO2 and depth. Now this is data taken from June 29th when the ice cover is starting to melt. And as you can see, the surface waters are very high in methane and carbon dioxide. And again, this is that freshwater melt that's both high in methane and carbon dioxide coming from the lake and river due to the ice cover melt. So now I'm gonna show you data from a few more days. So again, the left one is methane and the right is PCO2. So it was removed from June 29th to June 30th 
and then to July 1st and July 2nd, you can see there's this rapid decrease in the PCO2 and methane levels in the surface waters. So methane and carbon dioxide are being rapidly re re released and then these levels are coming back down. And so this pulse of greenhouse gas emissions occurs very rapidly. So from our studies at Cambridge Bay, it's clear that there are intense methane emissions following the ice melt. The river discharge is found to account for about more than 95% of the annual methane emissions from this estuary system. And what we learned is that it is important to resolve the seasonal processes in interconnected marine and freshwater Arctic environments to quantify greenhouse gas emissions. We also see the need for new sensing technologies coupling different sensors to study heterogeneous and dynamic systems. So we were supposed to return to Cambridge Bay in June 2020, but COVID put a stop to that. So we're hoping we'll be able to return safely in 2021 and 2022 to continue this research. So our goal in our future research is to really understand how future increases in Arctic river discharge and changes in the timing of ice melt could alter greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. In this future work, we're gonna bring the Kamiak back um, to do more spatial studies. Um, as Eric mentioned, we're also going to be using a low-cost blue ROV, and the goal with that is actually to equip it with a CTD and oxygen sensor, um, just like Eric mentioned, and to bring that system down under the ice, where we'll also be pumping water back to the methane sensor. So we actually want to be able to try to make these methane measurements under the ice um, to look at how much methane is trapped under the ice. We're also aiming to use isotopic measurements to determine the source of the methane, and finally, our goal is to bring drones so we'll be able to capture images of the ice breakup while we're out in the field. And finally, I just want to thank everybody who's been part of the, the Chemiac projects in different phases. Um, we have funding from the National Science Foundation. Our preliminary work was funded by HUI. Um, I want to thank um, RBR for letting me be part of this cohort and working with us in the future on trying to bring out some new CTDs and oxygen sensors out. Um, to these environments. And we've just recently published a paper talking about this research. Um, there's a QR code there, or you can look it up in Man it's by Manning et al. 2020 in GRL. And that really goes a bit more in depth into the science um, of what we're working on. And I want to thank everybody for listening to this. And Ru and I are both happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thanks, Anna. That was very interesting. I certainly learned a lot and I took some notes. Uh, I have some questions as well, but what I'd like to do is open it up for other uh, other participants to either text in some questions uh, or to ask them. Let's see, we've got one that just came in now from Jean Damien. Um, how often would you recommend to calibrate uh, the CH4 sensor installed on board uh, your platform? That's a great question. So we usually calibrate it before, well, in this, this instance, we calibrated it before and after we went um, into the field. But the nice thing about the fact that it's an atmospheric sensor is that um, as soon as you go from the water to the air, it'll drop back down to atmospheric levels. So you can do an easy quick check um, to make sure you're measuring about the right value because the values are so different from being in the water. And I'll also add to that, um, a lot of it is understanding that extraction efficiency very well. So if you were to change your configuration in terms of the, um, pumping through that system or the um, type of um, equilibration module you're using, you would want to recalibrate that system. Another question here. here. Should, I stop, should I stop sharing or should I leave the uh, sharing on? Sure, you can stop sharing. I, uh, people have either seen your QR code or uh, I know Ruz pushed it out and we'll also push it out in an email as well. So people will have access to that. Um, we've got another question here which is um, what mechanism of um, CH4 saturation in water? Uh, and is it coming from air or melting at, uh, methane hydrates at the bottom? Rue, do you want to actually take that question because your student's going to be working on sort of that yeah, idea? Sure. Of so, um, yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, a lot of the study of methane Arctic has actually focused on sources that come from the bottom um, such as some of the um, methane hydrates that may destabilize. However, in this system, we're looking at actually a quite a different process. So um, we believe the methane is originating from the freshwater ecosystems and is um, um, biologically generated in anoxic environments. And then it's carried into the coastal ocean um, with freshwater dis discharge that, that peaks in the spring. And that's why we see such a pronounced peak in the spring. 
And that's also the reason we see it very much concentrated in this fresh surface layer um, within the bay and not, um, and the deeper values are much closer to atmospheric equilibrium. Um, a further question that we plan to investigate in the future is if that methane is um, produced is from a, um, produced from a, mo a modern carbon source, or if it's uh, originating from old permafrost carbon, and that'll involve some follow-up work we're intending to do with um, radiocarbon um, dating of the methane. Okay, we have another question, which is, are you planning to deploy in Grenier Lake next year? So our goal is to come back in 2021. So we'll have to see what the COVID situation is um, and see if we're able to travel and if it's safe, not only for us, but also for the native um, population there. Um, so we have not actually deployed in the lake. Um, we did do some measurements of taking our instruments out to the lake. Um, we do now have an extra set of instruments. So we hope to be able to make some more measurements in Grenier Lake. Um, next summer. And also we'd like to be able to use the drone over Grenier Lake to actually watch that ice break up. So the Kamiak itself probably won't go in the lake, but we will have a set of instruments to make similar kinds of measurements um, and possibly using the ROV um, in the lake. Okay, uh, so uh, Kurt Rosenberger is pointing uh, to a paper where people are doing methane measurements from a drone. That's pretty cool. Uh, hopefully small amounts of water sample or large drone or both probably. Um, I had a question while we're waiting for other people to text in their questions. In your plots of methane versus, uh, versus depth you showed, and versus space, you showed very high resolution, um, both in, in uh, the vertical and in the horizontal as you're moving around. But I imagine there's some time constant in terms of pumping the water up, um, extracting the, the gases and making the measurements. What, what are the time constants that you think about or spatial, um, either in space or time, to get that kind of high resolution? Yeah, so we have about a, it's about a 26 second delay from the bottom of the uh, wind system up to where it's actually analyzed. So it's pretty fast. Um, yeah, we do have to account for the fact that our vehicle is moving forward and actually it doesn't hold station very well. So we don't stop and do many direct profiles. And that's why we typically actually leave the winch system lowered and move along and then raise and come back because we that spatial mobility isn't quite there with the system yet. We would like to be able to do that a little bit faster in the future. So it takes about 26 seconds from when you say go for the water to go up the hose, um, have the gas extracted, and then make the measurement. And can you, if, if there's a change in methane, will you see that change within a couple seconds? We see it pretty fast. Um, we are monitoring methane. Um, we can monitor it actually from an iPad um, or from a computer, and you can see it change. Um, within within a very short amount of time, but we're just monitoring that and we do the post-processing after, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, and but we can actually literally observe it with an iPad. And we've done um, response time tests in the lab of doing step changes in methane concentration and the inherent time response of this system is around 20 um, seconds or somewhere around there. Okay. Uh, Let's open it up. Of course, there are more questions. Uh, there's another one here. Um, do you have plans? Uh, you know, if anyone have plans for those sensors directly in the water or not pumped? Ah, right. Can you just make the measurement underwater or do you have to bring it up to the surface? That's a really good question. So in my other world of science, um, that's actually what we do. We develop in-situ sensors to put on large ROVs to put directly in the water. Um, we still do pump, but we're pumping water in the deep ocean. Um, and they're very similar to these kinds of systems. They're ICOS systems or they're a different kind of spectroscopy system. Um, they're packaged in underwater housings. We can use them. We've used them down to about 4,000 meters. Um, and so those have a little bit of a different application. We are working on um, some newer methane systems that are um, that we're building in our lab to do exactly that. So our goal is, yes, can we have systems that we just throw in the in the water and continuously measure as opposed to just doing the surface water? They have different, um, the applications are different. Um, the levels of methane are totally different. Um, but yes, that is a very, you know, that's where we want to eventually go. But we are doing this for the deep ocean right now. Okay. Thank you. Let's uh, see if there are any other questions. And people are welcome to turn their mics on and ask uh, a question the old-fashioned way if they don't want to type it in.
Okay, I'm going to uh, thank you for this. We'll stick around. If anyone else has questions, we'll stick around. But I want to thank uh, Anna and Rue for joining us, for presenting their work, and for answering all the interesting questions. Thank you very much.